This is a collection of seven stones. They're called stones. They're actually amalgamation of, of materials. Uh, some refer to them as roofing tiles from ground zero at Hiroshima. So the explosion destroyed the landscape and the buildings, the buildings exploded, the, the infrastructure exploded, the roads. So what you have here in, in that riverbed was, a, was what I would call an amalgam of, of material or medium. So this isn't a good example. Um, it has a little piece of glass in it. It has, a, it has what obviously is iron from the, from the orange color. It has little pieces of, of uh, material that looks like building material. So uh, the, they are not stones in the traditional sense that we think of as river boulders. Um, this, one, this one has uh, what looks like um, bits of uh, paving. Um, so th they're not, we call them Hiroshima stones. I think the more accurate term, uh, the Japanese would refer to them as Hiroshima tiles, roofing tiles. But the truth of the matter is, is that they are a, they are a fusion. They are a fused uh, three or four types of material, three or four mediums fused together by the heat, by the force and the power and the heat generated by an atomic bomb. And that in itself is very symbolic. The story behind these is, is an emotional one and a powerful one. Um, the Japanese believe strongly that on the day the bomb was dropped, um, so many thousands of people were literally um, on fire. And they threw themselves into the rivers. There are seven rivers that come together in Hiroshima. And the Japanese believe that the stones in that riverbed absorb the souls of, of those individuals. So that's, that's, that's the rationale, that's the symbolism behind these stones. Um, that's a very powerful story. Um, it, it, and when I shared that with the students in Janet Akeda's class, who were studying Japanese culture and language, there was silence, as, as I expected. Uh, but there was also a sense of, of awe because th they, were, they felt, as I have, have always felt it, that they were in the presence of something very sacred. If you look at the fact that, peace, that Hiroshima University has become Peace University, uh, the mission is that it will never happen again. There, there is this overarching um, feeling of hope, and I think that comes out loud and clear in this books and um, and this this very sacred these very sacred stones. Hope is is the message here. I think that's what they were trying to say to us when they sent this to us in 2011. There is, we we still believe in hope.
Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We'll be getting started with introductions in just a moment, so please make yourselves comfortable. Before we begin, a quick note about Q&A for those of you joining us live in the Zoom webinar. You should see a control in your Zoom interface near the bottom labeled Q&A. Later on, you'll have the opportunity to use this control to submit typed questions to us. Professors Brian Murchison and Jeremy Weissman of the Mudd Center will read out those questions for our panelists to address. We appreciate your understanding as we ask that you refrain from submitting your questions until invited to do so. Once again, we'll be getting started after a short delay to allow time for more attendees to join the webinar. We thank you for your patience. Thank you again, everyone, for your patience. In just a moment, we'll turn things over to Professor Mark Rush, Director of International Education, and Stanley D. and Nikki Waxberg, Professor of Politics and Law at WNL, to give the introduction for tonight's guest speaker and topic. Before that, let's briefly give our attention to Director Brian Murchison of the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics for a brief special message. Good afternoon. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the passing last week of Roger Mudd, a member of Washington and Lee's class of 1950. He was a much respected journalist at CBS and NBC and PBS, and he was also associated with the History Channel. It was his generosity and vision that made possible the creation of the Mudd Center at this university. We thank him for that and for the example he set of devotion to professional values, the public good, and service to others. Thank you, Mr. Mudd. Thank you, Brian. And uh, good evening and welcome, everybody. My name is Mark Rush. I'm the director of the Center for International Education, and it's my job tonight to introduce the panel and our speaker, um, Felix Kwame Yeboah. Uh, let me begin by saying, again, thanks to Roger Mudd um, and our benefactors at the Center for International Education, the president, the provost, the deans, for supporting this entire series. Um, it's really an honor to be able to work at a university and work with colleagues and in these centers uh, whose existence really is a manifestation, not only of all the hard work and ded dedication of faculty, staff, administrators, students, but also our benefactors and many of whom are our alumni who support the efforts of the university um, and really make it possible for us to do some, some remarkable things every year. And it's a pleasure to be part of all that. Um, tonight, again, my job is to welcome all of you to uh, this evening's uh, speaker. Felix Kwame Boa and his lecture, which is jointly sponsored by the Center for International Education and the Mudd Center for Ethics. Um, tonight's panel uh, has many participants. Uh, Felix will speak and I will introduce him in just a second. He and I and Professor Dayoaba are sharing the podium after he speaks. Uh, Professor Aba and I will uh, ask several questions uh, to follow up on his talk. And then we will turn the evening over to Professor Murchison and Professor Wiseman, uh, who will field your questions and continue the conversation with, uh, with all the questions coming from you all in the audience, both online and Zoom and coming through the live stream. Um, so Dr. Felix Kwame Yeboah comes to us uh, from the Department of Intermet International Development at Michigan State University, where he is an, excuse me, an assistant professor. Um, his, uh, he holds a degree, a bachelor's degree in natural resource management from Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. He holds a PhD in environmental policy and international development from Michigan State University, where, as I mentioned, he is also a member of the faculty. 
Um, the scope of his research is vast. It covers so many aspects of international development, demographics, uh, environmental policy, climate change, agriculture, and so forth. The list goes on forever, as does the scope of his publications and research. Um, it is truly remarkable uh, to have a speaker, a guest here virtually. We wish we, we wish you were right here on campus, um, whose breadth of research and the importance of whose research is as broad and profound, I think, as Dr. Yaboa's work. Uh, and tonight, especially, we can we will hear him speaking on a report he has done recently and follow-up research called Youth for Growth, Transforming Economies Through Agriculture. Um, this is a fantastic study. It's an accessible study, which covers the gamut of economics research, demographics, as well as ethics. Um, in his vision, in his suggestions in this report, um, he offers not only academic communities, but the world really a vision for moving forward to tackle questions of equality, food security, self-determination, and so on and so forth, with a focus on Africa in this particular study, but really the ramifications extend around the world. Um, so it'll be my pleasure then to turn the podium over to Dr. Yabo in just one second. As a note, we will, as I said, finish, uh, follow him with Professor Dayawaba asking the first question. Uh, she and I will exchange a couple of questions with Felix before turning the program over to Professor Murchison and Professor Weissman. So it's my pleasure now to stop talking and get out of the way. So tonight's guest, Dr. Felix Kwame Yaboa can speak to us. Welcome, Felix. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that generous introduction. It is indeed a pleasure to be here and to reconnect with all of you. I am here today because of Washington and Lee and the efforts of many who are on this call who have sown so much into my own life. Actually, it's what at Washington and Lee where I developed an interest in economics. And that one year of liberal arts education that I received at Washington and Lee provided the gateway to the resources, the connections, that has made it possible for me to address you today. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the Roger Matt Center for Ethics and the Center for International Education for extending this invitation to me. Now, the issue of Africa's youth is of personal and professional interest to me. Now, well, given my own background, but I also think it is one of the most pressing issues the world faces today. So to set the stage for our discussion, I decided to structure my remarks around three main questions. The first is, why should we even be concerned about Africa's youth? What opportunities do the agri-food system offer for the youth? And then what are the actions that can catalyze these young people for economic transformation on the continent? And I will start with the first. Why should we be concerned about Africa's youth? I think we need to be concerned about Africa's youth because of ongoing demographic ch changes in the 21st century which is going to make affairs in Africa, not just a preserve of Africans, but increasingly a global affair. Do you think that in the next 30 years, global population is expected to expand by 1.9 billion people and about 1.1 billion of the additional individuals are go going to be on the continent? That is more than every other person that will be born between now and that um, between now and 2050. And that is also equivalent to adding about three times the population of US to the African continent. So the population in Africa is going to double, which 
will require us to think about doubling health services, doubling education services, doubling infrastructure, most of which is already in short supply. And Africa's share of global population is also going to increase from 17% today to about 25% by mid-century. And as Africa increasingly account for a greater share of global population, Africa is going to exert an influence on global affairs, politically, economically, and even including their food systems. The African continent is also very young. Over 60% of the population is below the age of 25. And it is expected to be home to one in four of the world's global youth by 2050. So it is fair to say that Africa's impact on global affairs and the nature of growth that Africa is going to have is largely going to be determined by the values, the trainings, and the competencies of these young people. Now, these have significant implications for US economic and national security um, interest. So first of all, if you look at the large numbers of people, coupled with the fact that incomes are rising and the projections that consumer and business spending could reach as much as 6.7 trillion by 2030, makes the continent a significant and longest market for any business around the world. If Africa is going to be home to one in four global youth, academic institutions in the US may have to look at Africa as a significant pool for admissions. But I'm always reminded that numbers alone do not constitute labor. They have to be scaled in the same way that numbers do not constitute market if they don't have ability to pay. So Africa's potential as a future market will be determined by how much economic opportunities expand for this large group of um, young people. Otherwise, we could see these young people become a source of civil unrest, increased migration, and extremism that could potentially invite costly military interventions and humanitarian uh, around uh, uh, from, 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 from us all. I know a number of ethical questions come up here, but I'll just focus on one. Do these African youth have a right to food, to a meaningful livelihood, and to education? I believe only a few um, or many of you will agree with me that, uh, yes, they do have the right. The challenge, however, has always been the how. How do we activate that right and make this right a reality for these young people? And for me, that is the part where I feel the agri food sector offers opportunity. And I'll give three main reasons for that. The first is we've seen the combined forces of urbanization, population growth, and rising incomes, significantly fueling a, a rising demand in food and agricultural products. But unfortunately, Africa's agriculture and food system has not evolved to be able to meet this rising demand. And some countries like Nigeria, Angola, are increasingly relying on food imports to meet that food demand. So there is an opportunity to be able for job creation if local capacity can be built to at least satisfy some of that demand. 
Second Agriculture is the largest employer of the African youth. A large share of them are already engaged in the agricultural sector, but most of them are engaged in low productive agriculture or any in very little that could help sustain them. So investment in agriculture could also reach the largest number of African youth. And then thirdly, and perhaps maybe more importantly, agriculture have very strong employment and income multiplier effects. We know that any investment in agriculture, an investment in agriculture generates about twice the poverty reduction that you will get from investment in other sectors. And given that a large number of people are still within the agricultural sector, agriculture is going to play a significant role in the pace at which job grow in the off-farm as well as even in the on-farm sector. And We've already seen that in, in my own work. We've seen that agricultural productivity has been a significant driver of Africa's recent economic transformation. So countries like Ghana, Rwanda, Tanzania that invested to increase productivity on agricultural productivity have seen the most rapid drop in poverty They've also seen the most rapid exit of labor outside of um, out of agriculture, and I've seen the most rapid growth in labor productivity in the non-farm sector, similar to what we saw with Green Revolution Asia. So then, is how do we seize this opportunity, and what actions can we take to seize this opportunity? It is widely agreed that. For these young Africans to effectively con um, contribute to socioeconomic transformation, they need to be well-fed and healthy. They need to be well-educated and they also need to be gainfully employed. This is going to require investment in multiple areas, but I believe two broad areas are important. The first is investment in broad-based agricultural productivity growth. This will help raise the incomes of the millions of young people and their families who rely on the agriculture for their livelihoods. And then how to allow them to be and now make the needed investment in human capital, in education and in the health. It's also going to increase the competitiveness and the resilience of the local food production system. It's also going to generate the growth multipliers that create new jobs in the overall economy. Broad-based productivity growth is going to require specific and targeted investments. So like investment in agriculture research and, uh, research and development and robust extension services uh, to promote efficient and effective use of existing resources and technologies. Similar to what the land grant university mission and corporate extension date to power agricultural transformation in the United States is going to require physical infrastructure, irrigation, roads, electricity, that will reduce the cost of doing business and facilitate market access and enhance competitiveness. It's also going to require investment to strengthen the linkages between farm and the off-farm sector through value addition to agricultural products and creating the enabling environment to bring in private investment in the agro-based industry. The second area of investment is going to be human capital um, development, which will help upgrade the skills of those that are engaged in the sector and enable them to be able to see the opportunities that are there and amply take advantage of them. Human capital is also going to be critical to help accelerate the pace of the demographic transition, especially if it is targeted at educating young uh, girls. And that sh should also require a life cycle approach, starting first of all with health and nutrition, especially during the first thousand days of a child's life where brain development starts and to avert all those 
um, stunting and the negative effect of learning, learning abilities, which, uh, which is estimated to, to cost the continent about 11% of GNP every year. There's also inv investment to improve access to quality education and skills training. I mentioned earlier on about the need to prioritize girls' education. And because we know that educated girls tend to marry and start having children later. They have fewer children. They invest more in their, cho uh, in their children and their children are, uh, tend to follow a similar pattern in the future. So just a recap after going through the first three questions. Why should we be concerned about Africa? We're talking about demographic shifts and a doubling of a population and the needs that will come. What opportunities that agri-food system offer is the largest employer and it has strong multiplier effects. And in terms of what we can do, let's invest in broad-based agriculture productivity and also human capital um, development. And I say that let's, let's do this investment because these investments actually pay off. And if you invest in African youth, we see the payoff. And I will illustrate that with a story. So um, in reaction to harsh economic conditions, um, a teacher migrated from Ghana to a neighboring country, uh, country in West Africa with the hope of eventually being able to make it to Europe or the United States to seek greener pastures. But while he was there waiting for his breakthrough visa, he secured a job as a language instructor in one of the local high school where he met this brilliant and hardworking student. And despite the fact that he was seeking his own economic emancipation, he decided to take a chance on this particular student. He taught him French, mentored him, and intervened with the student's own reluctant mother and convinced her to allow her son to attend college. After several failed attempts by the teacher to realize his own um, dreams of traveling abroad, he returned to Ghana, but kept in touch with his student who went on to secure a scholarship to study in the United States and eventually become a professor at Washington and Lee University. So two decades after the uh, encounter, the teacher who happens to be my father connected me to this student, Professor Mohammed Kamara, to, to whom I am eternally grateful for alerting me to the John M. Gann Scholarship, which brought myself and my brother both to Washington and Lee and made our achievement of our academic goals possible. And that opportunity that was given to him three decades ago has become a blessing to me and my family. And we are also continuing to extend it to others. I know that this story is wonderful, but it is yet a real one because most Africans, youth, do not get that opportunity and that myself, Professor Kamara, or my brother has had. And the difference between us and them is this opportunity. Now, as I conclude, I'm reminded of a quote by Dr. King. So whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. I think this statement rings true today. And if anything at all, COVID-19 has taught us of our shared humanity, interconnectedness, and interdependence. And in essence, America will not be able to reach its full potential if Africa, which may comprise of a quarter of the world's population, 
does not do well. To me, supporting Africa's youth and development is not a matter of charity. It's rather in an investment in America's own future market and soft power. I believe, and I've seen it across the continent, that Africa's youth are primed for investment that will catalyze them to lead the Africa's transformation. And with proactive and strategic investment in broad-based agricultural productivity growth in human capital development, we can harness the creativity and extraordinary entrepreneurial spirit to support economic prosperity in Africa and transform them into a vibrant market and collaborators to address pressing global challenges. Thank you. And I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yeboa. That was really interesting. I learned a lot from your presentation. Um, I am going to ask you the very first question and then we'll, we'll continue our conversation from, from there. There, I noticed some challenges and um, as attractive, I, I thought your, you know, your presentation, the idea of agriculture investment for youth development is very attractive. However, as you probably know, uh, only about 10% of land in Sub-Saharan Africa is formally documented. Right, More, the, the rest of them are held under customary land tenure and so on. That's one challenge. The other challenge is that 93% of Africa's uncultivated arable land is concentrated in just nine countries. Mm -hmm. So given these challenges, how will, you know, how would you convince, uh, you know, African nations, you know, to come together to implement this vision, because given the scarcity of land, given all of you know the, the, the undocumented land ownership, basically for the purpose of this presentation, that would translate into access to land rights, right? Uh, given all of that, how would you convince uh, African leaders to come together uh, and execute this vision? Would, do you think that would be a possibility? Um, how do you feel about that? Well, th thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Dayo, for, for that question. I think you raised the, uh, the question that in one, in one meeting that I was, you, you talk about land and they said you brought the, uh, that is the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. Um, but land is definitely a major um, sticking point when it comes to this particular uh, um, a vision, because if you think of the fact that despite the widespread perception that there is a lot of land on the continent, when you break it down, you realize that about 90% of all available land is concentrated in just nine countries. The remaining 45 are either approaching the limits of their um, land extent or already land constrained. So land is going to be one of the binding um, constraint that uh, we have. But I also want to point out um, that I'm talking about the entire agri-food system, which will comprise of agriculture, as well as related industries along the value chain. So we think about everything that goes into the production of food from the farm to the fork. So some of these young people that we are talking about may not necessarily have to engage in tilling their land. They may be engaged in providing those extension services as they are relatively more educated. Now, this generation is far more educated or at least have seen have more schooling than previous generation. So they could play a role in providing um, services. And we've seen a number of them educated young individuals go in there uh, so, for example, in Ghana, there was this uh, tech group 
called CalTri that are using ICT to be able to connect farmers to veterinary services. It's a youth-owned uh, businesses. We've seen a number of um, them using IT as information providers. So there are a lot of opportunities along the value chain, which may not necessarily have to relate um, to land. I would also want to point out that at the continental level, um, this has been uh, a vision that African leaders have bought into. And we see that in 2003, AU, uh, at the AU summit, they signed the CADEP agreement, which is the Continental African Agricultural Development Program. And the commitment was that each country should strive to grow the agricultural sector by 6% annually and commit about 10% of public spending or their total public spending to the agriculture because they see the agriculture as a means to be able to um, grow, uh, um, grow food, address food security challenges, as well as to provide um, jobs. This was reinforced in 2014 with the Malabo Declaration of Accelerated Agricultural Growth and Shared Prosperity. And now we are also seeing African countries coming together for the African continental uh, free trade um, area, which is all meant to be able to facilitate trade. Majority of it is going to be agricultural commodity uh, based. So there's general, I would say at least, there is some gathering around this leadership from the AU side and countries have taken up some of that. I'll give you an example, like Ghana. Ghana have um, introduced um, the planting for food and jobs, uh, which is built on that kind of framework. We have seen Eth Ethiopia, which used to be the poster child of farming, also implement an agriculture um, strategy, which has transformed um, Ethiopia. So there have been some buy-ins, at least at a at the regional, at least at the continental level and the regional uh, level, but land remains a binding constraint. And uh, I'll be happy to, to discuss a little bit more about that. Thank you for that question. I feel like it's my turn. Um, again, thank you for the presentation and uh, for a tremendous study. I recommend it to everyone in the audience. Um, <clears throat> you make a, what I think is an incredibly powerful, convincing economic analysis that's driven by an equally powerful ethical vision of improving the lives of all, Amer all Africans and by extension, the world uh, by addressing matters of food insecurity and so on and so forth. Um, but there's also no question that uh, the success of your, your vision, your plan, uh, depends on what's now would be a radical notion really of sacrificing short-term individual self-interest um, for a better world in the long run. I mean, it's really a plan for intergenerational stewardship and it raises questions about what we, the present, offer to the grandchildren that haven't even been born yet. So what I wanna ask is how do you see, you've got this powerful economic vision and this powerful ethical vision, both of which are quite similar, both involve choices. So what I want to ask is how do you see or how would you suggest that the continent could go about uh, mobilizing today's youth? You say this is youth, youth for growth. How can we make this an appealing program of what is essentially you know, intergenerational continental service? Um, because in order to get gener you know, the current generation to, to do this, they're going to have to have a clear vision and feel a connection to the grandchildren. That's a tough challenge. How do you recommend pursuing it? Well, thank, th thank you very much. And uh, I would say that mobilizing the youth is going to be based on um, appealing to their self-interest. And I know that in a climate where the narrative had always been youth are against agriculture, uh, it becomes a little bit difficult to move forward. But 
I, I beg to defy a little bit um, to say that I don't think youth are interested in any particular sector. They are just interested in opportunities. And if you make agriculture profitable and productive, they will go into it. And because the same kind of young people that we say are not interested in agriculture are the ones who will risk their lives on the Mediterranean Sea, get to Italy and work on the farm. The difference is, is the economics. So if we can make the agricultural sector less laborious, a little bit more technology that reduces how laborious it is, and a little more profitable, people, young people are going to go into it. So I think the first one is helping them to see those opportunities as viable options for them. And, and, and I've seen, we've seen several uh, um, the patterns now. So on the continent now, we have seen a large number of young people leaving agriculture sector. But we still have a large number of rural youth who are still engaged in agriculture. And one of the studies that we did realized that the narrative that Africa's population in farming is aging is around 60, is unfounded. Most of those that are engaged in agriculture, at least on a full-time basis, are below the age of 40, because there's still a large share of young people that are left in the agricultural sector who are putting a down trend on the um, average age there. But we are also seeing a new group of young people who have seen these opportunities and are taking advantage of that. And I'll give you an example. There's this young man um, that I met in Ghana who went to UK to do his master's, came home with just a little bit of savings and was looking for a place where he could invest it. Someone told him now the money is in the agricultural sector. He did some research and realized that pineapples could be what he could produce. He went to Blue Skies, which is one processing plant and asked them, what kind of pineapples do you procure? They gave him the dimensions. He did his research work and then rented one acre farm a one acre land to start producing those pineapples. In three years, he has expanded to 30 acres and is now employing a large number of people to support it. He saw that opportunity and across the continent, we are seeing a number of those coming in. So it is those who can come in with the skill set that we need in the sector to help transform. And that is why I talked about youth needs agriculture and agriculture also needs youth. It needs those skilled youth to be able to transform the sector for, for all of us. So we need to support them to see the opportunity, but we also need to address some of the constraints that these young people face. The access to finance, finance is a big thing. Um, just last week, I was talking to one of the entrepreneurs um, that I have in a study that I, uh, I have in a project that I'm running and with COVID, he's now just looking for $2,000 to be able to prop up his processing plan to remain afloat, but he cannot get that finance to support him. Interest rates are over 30%. And sometimes the banks see agriculture as a risky endeavor and do not want to put money into it. So thinking about ways to be able to help them address the financial constraint. Maybe some government-backed loan uh, uh, um, guarantees or finding some ways to be able to help them. And then we talked about um, the issue of land. Land is also one of the binding constraints. Yeah. Increasingly, a number of young people, especially rural youth, are having difficulty being able to assess land uh, because of increased life expectancy of their um, parents, they now have to wait longer to be able to assess uh, land. How do we ensure that these ones have land? Or we need to also come up with other means or technologies that will allow us to be able to grow food 
without necessarily having ha having to have it uh, be land based. So so those will be the ways that I think we can do to mobilize them. And there can also be a government effort, you know, a government program that is focused on doing that. I know in Ghana now they have what they call the Nation Builders Core that the government introduced to help unemployed young individuals. And it attaches them to various sectors in the economy and they work and the government pay them for two years with the hope that that will give them the experience and that within that two years, they will be able to demonstrate their relevance to the organization and to and hopefully be absorbed by that organization. A similar approach could be used for, for, for the agricultural sector. Um, I talked about using them for extension services and using them for other, um, for, for other needs, which the youth are very much um, competent to handle. So thank, thanks again for that question, uh, Mike. I think it's my turn again. <laughs> um, I, um, I was also wondering, uh, given, you know, one of the greatest obstacles to uh, economic development in Africa has been, um, you know, weak civil liberties, right? Um, dependence on commodities, excessive dependence on you know, commodities and um, self-interest. You know, we have individual nations who have multipolar uh, and diversified alliances with China, with, you know, people all over the place. We have uh, sectors who have alliances, uh, you know, like oil producing countries, you know, so they have existing al alliances that are benefiting a few and therefore uh, the self-interest of those nations um, are very important to them in what they are, you know, even in the broken system that most African nations have now, there are people who are beneficiaries of this broken system. So how do we overcome um, the, the self-interest of nations from, you know, especially those that, that are benefiting from the status quo um, and who, who will be resistant to any kind of change uh, that might change their own fortune. Thank you. Well, th th thank you very much. Um, it, it's, it's certainly a challenging task. Um, and you would always find situations where people are going to do things that are in their self-interest. Uh, but I always think that even when they are pursuing their self-interest, there may be a way to be able to direct some of their self-interest for the greater good. And sometimes what it means is helping them to see how they could also benefit if things change. And I'll give an example. When we talk about regional integration, trying to create a common market on the African continent, countries that are a little bit more advanced will start talking about, oh, then we are going to get an influx of labor from other places, right? So for example, we talk about South Africa, who are concerned about individuals coming from Zimbabwe or from Mozambique, who because of apartheid are relatively well educated than they may be um, in South Africa and may be competing with them, which we have seen in xenophobia. So it is only expected that a country like South Africa, South Africa may be resistant to regional integration at all. But on the flip side, South Africa could also be one of the big winners when it comes to regional integration because it is more industrialized and already have the capacity to be able to produce to supply the rest of the continent. So they have a bigger market share in the end. So I think it is about framing. It is how we frame the narrative and we make that appeal. And to the extent that we're able to appeal to that interest, let's understand what is that that they are more concerned about, right? If it is about an influx of people, could we also say that there are going to be opportunities for jobs for South Africans somewhere else, and we are going to facilitate that? And then also bring the market angle to help them. 
But I believe framing is an important, and we can talk about the framing also even in international context. Now there's a lot of talk about China involvement in Africa. So if China is in Africa, then um, if China wins the role, then the US have lost. But I don't think it's a zero sum game. I think it's about framing. China, may, Africa needs every help that they can get because of the deficit that needs to be addressed. China can build the roads, but the US will use the roads to transport technology. China will build the airports and US will fly Boeing in, will supply the Boeings. Africa benefits, China benefits, and the US also benefits. So we need to think a little bit more about win-win situations and not just win-lose situations and framing it in a way that appeals to their self-interest might be uh, the way um, to go. And I, I certainly understand that uh, there are a lot of constraints. Talk about colonial legacy, talk about um, being able to meet the demands and uh, in your local um, country without inviting in political strife is always a challenge, but, I, but I, the framing will certainly address some of that. Thank you. Thank you, Dial. Thank you, Felix. I get to ask the last question, which will, and then we will turn it over uh, to the audience uh, for questions, and Jeremy and Brian will, will field those. So with the last question, I just want to ask you if um, you could, you know, I just want to follow up a little bit on the earlier earlier questions and, and how we've been discussing really what, what, what amounts to a powerful economic analysis prescription. Um, and you, you're speaking in terms of appealing to individual self-interest um, as a means of pursuing what's really an ethical outcome that transcends self-interest. And so I'm wondering if you just fra frame the ethical question, uh, if you will, it, what's essentially an ethical question of collective human well-being, humanity's well-being. Um, and especially African well-being that lies at the core of your analysis. If you, if you were to take this out of the economics department and maybe go to the ethics department or the philosophy <laughs> department, how would you frame that core question? Because economics is the tool, it's the means to what is clearly an ethical end. Well, so, 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 so let, me, let me see if I get it quickly. So how will I frame it in an ethical sense? I, I, I think I think it's it's more or less like um, trying to appeal to collectivism versus individualism, and trying to see which of those um, more or less this is going to require it's, it's certainly going to require um, a collective approach to be able to address it and not much of a self-interest. But it's difficult to be able to get that self, um, to get that collectivism without addressing some of those self-interest. So in my mind, I think um, that if we are thinking about a potential question, it will be about how do we appeal to a self-interested individual or self-interested nations and make it possible for them to pursue this from a self-interested perspective. And um, it's a little bit hard. And I think, I, I think I, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. If you think about this more from the standpoint of, can we pursue this through to, um, to, uh, totalitarian ways and says, look, this is, this, is the, um, this is a situation. We believe that it's ethical for these people to have food, to have this. You have more than enough. We're going to, so now we're going to take some of that and give it to these people. Will it be ethical to do that? That is one question that we all need to wrestle with. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning that it's a question of um, appealing to self-interest. And that is where I believe the ethical is, is a how, is a how which seems to be much of a challenge. 
Thanks. Yes. Just, let me I'll follow up with one, last, just a, a tweak okay. on this then. How do we, um, you know, what you're calling for is you, when you think about global program, other global programs, everything mm -hmm. from say in the United States, I can think of growing up, how we solve the litter problems. Somehow we change the psyche of the population. We just simply stop that. Now litter is hardly on the scale of food insecurity on a continental wide scale, but it seems that, um, you know, what you're proposing, the, you know, the, the solution to food insecurity across the globe, you know, poses the same vexing challenges and say how to resolve climate change. Mm -hmm. And so is it really, I mean, you said totalitarianism. I wonder if it's, is that, I mean, that's a powerful word that is scary, mm -hmm. but you're, re you're, you're really thinking about how to change, tweak a little bit the prevailing uh, ethical framework, which at least around the world generally is focused on individual rights. Um, is there a parallel that you say then? you know, to climate change, to addressing something like climate change? How do we get the world to pull together through diplomacy or, 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 you know, how long can we afford to wait before the end becomes so necessary to pursue? I, I, I think it goes back to what I indicated earlier on about appealing to self-interest. And, 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 I, and I, I think, um, especially if, we, if we're talking about respecting the human rights and, and the framing is always a powerful tool. We talked about in the past where the Marshall Plan uh, for Europe, right? Framed in the, in the way that a thriving Europe is in US interest, <laughs> right? In the same way, we could say that a thriving Africa is going to be in the interest of US. It's the interest of US for Africa to do well if US is going to uh, do well. And if there's anything that I, um, I learned from Washington and Lee during my time there in the class with Jim Casey, when we were talking about these environmental challenges, we talked about they may not care about climate change, but they may care about air quality. So don't tell them about climate change, but tell them that if you help to reduce smoke, your children will breathe better and you don't have to deal with asthma. So let's find those carrots that work for each of those self-interests and give it to them and frame it in a way that is benefiting because there's always going to be a benefit for individuals. And typically I think um, we tend to, uh, those who benefit from the status quo are always reluctant about the next option. So there's always going to be some resistance. So there is also important to help assure them that the losses that they may have with the change could be compensated in other ways and helping them to see the bigger picture. I sometimes talk about it this way, that I would like to be able to retire and live in my community without having to build walls around my house. And to be able to do that, it means those around me need to do well because they are the best security you could ever have. You cannot enjoy your wealth if everyone around you is poor, they will rob you. So it is the framing of the issue that allows people to buy into, into it. I think one of the big challenge that we have now has got to do with information and disinformation in a social media um, world where everyone is an expert and someone can just pick up a phone today and start um, disseminating information as an expert and it starts going viral. That I believe is one of the biggest challenge that we have to getting that narrative right and getting people to buy into endeavors like this because people may not necessarily be able to sift through all that information to know which way it appeals um, to them. Thanks, we'll turn it over to Jeremy and Brian now. Great, well, thank you, Professor Yuboa, for a very interesting presentation and to the panelists and Professor Yuboa as well for the discussion. Uh, so we'll move to questions now. So please feel free uh, if you have any questions to put that into the, the Q&A uh, chat below. You should see it at the bottom of your Zoom screen. But in the meantime, uh, I'll go ahead and start off with a question just to get things going. 
Um, so my question is, you know, since the 90s, maybe with the sort of rise and power of the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, there's been lots of criticism of the role of kind of free trade, globalization, and multinational corporations, in, in especially multinational food corporations, in terms of their effects on local agriculture in, in uh, continents like Africa. So um, what role do you see uh, in multinational food corporations playing? Do you see it as mostly negative, displacing local farmers? Is there any role for them in your plan, or is it mostly that they need to uh, take on a different uh, aspect of their work or back off in some way? <laughs> I, I, I think that um, multinationals also have a role to play in this uh, big plan. And that um, I know they have been quite powerful uh, in influencing the agri-food system in different ways. But I also think that it comes down to how the returns from those investments are shared. It is not so much about what they do as it is about how the gains are shared within that industry. And I'll give you an example. So you talk about Ghana and Ivory Coast alone produces over 60% of the world cocoa. The chocolate industry is over a hundred billion dollar industry. But the two countries is only able to capture 6% of that. Think about that. 6% of that. Because they are largely exporting raw material. So the key question is, what prevents Cadbury from setting up a plant in Ghana and Ivory Coast after over 100 years of procuring raw materials from them. We can talk about all kinds, we can talk about some other constraints and the rest, but that is where the tensions come in. It's more about how things, the returns are distributed because a setting up of a factory could generate more jobs there than the raw material because the value is actually in the high end of the chain and not in the raw material. And unfortunately, a number of African countries have been stuck in that colonial economy that was built for them because the colonial economy was built on two main things. The first is be the raw material producer and then maintain your dependence on the colonial or on the, the, the metropoles as it was called. So when you think about um, raw material, when you think about much of the trade that is happening, it's a spot of raw materials for all these uh, years. And some of these trade agreement essentially reinforces that. You get tariff free if you are exporting raw materials, but if you add anything, if it's processed, then you are slapped with a high taxes, uh, tariff, which makes it difficult to assess those markets, right? And then you cannot do the same because it's a liberalized economy, free market. So we need to be able to, but it is the power differential that or the uh, initial resource allocation makes it difficult to have that kind of equal terms of trade. And that is, I believe, is some of the sticky point when it comes to the global trading system. Okay, Professor, here's another question from one of our uh, audience members. He begins, thank you for an enlightening presentation. Historically, the price for commodities, agricultural and otherwise, produced on the continent have been determined largely by buyers in the West. How can Africa divorce itself from this kind of trade relationship 
And what would that mean for the continent's growth and prosperity? Okay, thank you. Thanks for, for that question. I, I think it's going to require concerted effort to say uh, by African to say, we no longer exporting raw material, we're going to produce them locally. There are some challenges to it. Um, I know the, the, Ghanaian, the Ghanaian president just last week was in Switzerland and he essentially said that we want to, pro we want to process our cocoa and eventually make chocolate in Ghana and sell because we need that to be able to grow our economy. And I know even in Ghana itself, the local um, pro uh, producers, those local processes that started emerging are constantly running out of cocoa. Because even before the cocoa is produced, it's already bought. So this is a mechanism to help support these local industry so they can be able to do that. But it's going to require some significant amount of investment and capital to build the capacity to be able to produce and process at home. And I think one way of going about it is, again, going back to that collectivism instead of individualism. I believe individual countries should not be in the business of trying to set up these industries themselves. Togo might be too small to set up a plan for itself. But Togo, Ghana, Nigeria, and West Africa could have a regional value chain where they pull resources together and build those regional value chain that will eventually go on to process it and then sell and get more retained from that. So that could be one way of going about it, that Africa needs to pull their resources um, together. But that is also difficult, um, given some of the power dynamics and the legacies that we talked about. Um, so so because of allegiance or past um, interest that is there, uh, but I believe that there seems to be an emerging understanding that Africa needs to at least trade among itself, right? Trade among itself in order to address all these challenges. And one big challenge had also been physical infrastructure, which is also part of the legacy that has not been, uh, um, the continent has not been able to reverse because previously, again, with the colonial economy is colonies do not interact. So you don't build road or railways across colonies. You build it from the port of export, uh, the, the port the ports of production to the ports. So there's lack of physical infrastructure across the continent. And for 60 years, they are so struggling to do that. And infrastructure alone will require about $130 billion each year at a time where African nations are facing debt crisis, where will that finance come from? So some of the question would also be, is there a political will internationally to see Africa develop? And how do we build, um, get that kind of international will? And the question of if, if Africa, uh, uh, going with the notion that if Africa do well, the rest of the world will also do well. Well, here's a, another question. Um, thinking in continent-wide terms is ambitious. Is there a region in Africa that could perhaps begin to work together per your vision and lead the continent by example? I, I think that there are regional blocks on the continent that have also been working. And even, even when you think about those continental frameworks that we have, like the Agenda 2063, the CADE, the Malabo Declaration, the regional bodies um, like ECOWAS, um, SADC, the East African Community, all also have their own uh, policies that they are working on, right? But sometimes you also get, you run into the same kinds of issues that you, you, you get. Look, West Africa alone is 16 countries. Yeah, five of them are Anglophones, about nine or so of them are Francophones. 
uh, and they've been talking about a common currency for several years now. Uh, because the francophones have their currency pegged to euro and much of the economy is also controlled by France. So how do you get them to balance the interest that they have with their former colonial power with a regional interest or a continental wide uh, interest? And sometimes that is where the constraints uh, come from. So, and, and you can think about it in the, in, in the coins of leadership that Leadership is important, uh, but leadership is about influence and influence uh, demands some degree of control. And sometimes that wiggle room degree of control is not there uh, because the person you're trying to trade with, you cannot assert, um, uh, be assertive because you already owe that person. So it's the all equal terms of trade, it's the origin of those on equal terms of trade. And that is what we find ourselves in. Professor, we have another question from the audience. Can you speak specifically to the state of democracy on the continent and its significance for continental growth? That's, that's a very good um, question. I would say that um, I'll couch it broadly as governance. And I would say governance has improved tremendously in the continent over the past um, decade and a half. If you think of the fact that even just in the 80s and the 90s, more than half of the continent were ruled by essentially um, coup d'etat, uh, people that came through power, dictators who came through power, who came to power through coup d'etats. Now, if you look around, most African countries are now governed by democratically elected uh, individuals. You can we can talk about the, the, uh, we can we can debate on maybe how credible the elections are and the rest, but at least that concept of subjecting yourself to the people is one that is now being embraced. And if you also think about the fact that tremendous amount of growth that a continent saw between 1995 to the 2014, one of the key contributing factor to it was improvement in macroeconomic environment and governance. And it is largely in part to young Africans who had opportunity to study outside, came home and had opportunity to influence things in the country. Previously, you walk into Ministry of Agriculture and they had no technical aspect or someone who could look at the agricultural data and things to do that. Now, a number of them there are technical experts who have PhDs, who are studied across the world and are retained home. And I think that that has been a critical component of it. Even when you look at macroeconomic environment, those countries that have successfully been able to do that had primarily be, uh, been because of governance. And governance is rapidly uh, improving on the continent as more and more people become conversant with the need to be involved in, the, uh, in, in governance. So here's another question related to climate change. So how do we overcome the ravages of climate change, which further exacerbates the challenge of focusing on agriculture as the solution to the youth bulge in Africa? Um, uh, climate change is it's, it's quite tricky. And, and I know that climate change has a feedback loop with agriculture. Climate affects agriculture, especially in, in Africa where a vast majority relies on rain-fed um, agriculture. So climate definitely affects agriculture, but agriculture also, influ also affects the climate. If you look at greenhouse emissions coming from climate change, I think there have been a number of um, 
climate smart agriculture practices that have been coming up. So part of it is trying to embrace some of those activities to reduce the emissions that we are seeing in the agricultural sector. But I also want to point out that investment in agriculture do not necessarily keep people in agriculture. It helps people to leave agriculture. So you think of it this way. When you invest in agriculture and you have a large number of your people in, engage in agriculture, when you invest in agriculture, you increase income in the agricultural sector. So those who are working in agriculture will have increased income. Once they have more income, what happens? They spend more of that income on non-farm goods and services. They now want to braid their hair. They want to build houses. They want to sew clothes, right? All that creates a demand for jobs in the off-farm sector. And it pulls the excess labor that is in agriculture to the off-farm sector. And that was the multiplier effect that I was talking about. So if agriculture is a corporate when it comes to climate change, then the best way to minimize agriculture's impact is to get more people out of it into sectors which may not necessarily impact the climate, is to also make agriculture productive so that they can leave into, uh, to go into other sectors. Professor, one more question. If you could, uh, you know, we looked at your report, Youth for Growth, transforming mm -hmm. economies through agriculture. What kind of reception did your report get and what's the status of it now? It, it, it's an amazing compendium of statements of the issue and proposed solutions. What's the status of your report now? I think the, the report was widely embraced. Um, the Chicago Council for Global Affairs did a wonderful job trying to shop it around. On the day of launching it, we had the opportunity to go to Congress where we met with a, a select group of um, congressmen and senators and their staff to present some of the key messages in there. Um, after the report was launched, there was some concerted efforts to be able to follow up uh, with, with them and some of the recommendations that we had was taken into account when they were crafting the Global uh, Food Security um, Act. And one of them included providing finance for agricultural education because we, it was one of the areas that we identified that the knowledge gap in the agricultural sector needs to be addressed. So there was funding that was made available uh, to do that. There's still um, a lot of ongoing talks. Uh, the, the group that um, is at the council are uh, still trying to promote this as an important aspect of the subsequent to that, there was an additional report that, that was done on water, water scarcity. Um, there had been reports on climate change, but we continue to keep that on the agenda, uh, not, not just here in the US, but also um, in other African and um, the African countries, um, just to make sure that this is an important piece of work that gets the attention of policymakers. Are there supporters for some of your ideas in the Ghanaian parliament and in the political world? I, I, would, I would say yes. Now, um, I, I mentioned the you for uh, I mentioned the the, the, the the Ghanaian president flagship the current president, his flagship program is called Planting for Food and Jobs. And he has, he has made it one of um, a key pillar to transform the economy. And so they started this project where they supply seeds, fertilizer, um, extension services, and also monitoring and IT services to farmers. They picked, a set of, uh, they, they picked about five commodities that they supported. And then they complemented that with industrialization, which is setting up agro-based industries 
that can process the SS um, food that is going to be produced. And it is that agenda that gave him confidence to um, go to Switzerland and say that we want to process what we have, uh, what we have produced. And they've seen tremendous amount of um, food production. Ghana exported a lot of food um, this past couple of years because of this um, agenda. So there are a lot of tickets. And, I, and I'll say there are a lot of tickets even across the continent. Rwanda is a big example. I mentioned Ethiopia, Tanzania. So, and, um, and then there's an organization, AGRA, who is playing an important role in advancing this particular agenda. Well, we, would, we want to thank you. We have, we've gone beyond our time for this evening. It's been a tremendous uh, hour for us to hear your ideas, to think about possible solutions, and to um, have some hope for the future. We hope you will not be a stranger to Washington and Lee. You're always welcome here. And uh, would you please come back to our campus once it reopens and we can have another conversation? I'll be more than happy to. Uh, as I said from the beginning, uh, Washington and Lee was my first home in the US and I have a lot of fun memories and I develop very uh, meaningful friendship at Washington and Lee. So it's always my pleasure um, to return. I will certainly uh, be happy to return to Washington and Lee um, in, 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 in any capacity possible. Maybe we should all meet in Accra and uh, have a meeting over there. That, that, that would be excellent. That would be I'll excellent. I'll be, the, I'll be there. Definitely. I'll be more than happy uh, to be the chaperone for that group. That's very, we, we might need a chaperone. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, um, Professor, and all best wishes to you, and we'll be staying in touch with you. Definitely. Thank you very much uh, for, for this invitation. It's always a pleasure. It was our pleasure, and thank you to the audience, to Professor Abba, to Professor Rush, and Professor Weissman. It's been, a, it's been a wonderful evening, and I think Roger Mudd would have been very proud of this session tonight. So thank you very much. <laughs>